Einstein's two theories of relativity called the special theory and the general theory are rooted in four assumptions. The first assumption is that the speed of light propagation is constant. The second assumption is that even the effect of inertia, which Newton had postulated as the backward push we experience while accelerating forward, is basically a gravitational effect, such that the distinction between the inertial and gravitational masses, which had been created by Newton, is false. The third assumption is that space and time have no meaning other than the instruments by which we measure it because all words have to be understood in terms of measurable properties rather than as pure concepts. The fourth assumption is that all observers are equivalent such that we can never call one observer's measurement true while calling another observer's measurement false. Each of these four assumptions are false, as we will discuss over the course of the present video and the next one. However, to understand why these assumptions are false, we have to first discuss the assumptions themselves in quite detail. I will do this discussion in this video. Toward the end of this video, we will discuss the unsolved problems of relativity theory which will then become the motivation to discuss alternative approaches that are consistent with all observations done so far and yet different in their portrayal of reality. I will discuss such an alternative in the next video. The theories of relativity are much more conceptually complicated than quantum mechanics, but they have received far less conceptual scrutiny because they fit nicely with Newton's mechanics, which is considered the default way in which science has to be done. Quantum mechanics, in contrast, depart significantly from Newton's mechanics. Since Newton's mechanics is considered the default way of doing science, therefore, quantum mechanics that departs from Newton's mechanics significantly receives far more attention than relativity theory. But since relativity is factually more complex and troublesome, therefore we have to discuss its origins and concepts in far greater detail compared to quantum mechanics. Hence, we have to split the discussion of the origins and concepts of relativity theory from the discussion of the alternative. We will discuss the origins and concepts of relativity theory in this video by examining its four major assumptions. Let's begin with the special theory of relativity, since it came before the general theory. The brief background is that light came to be seen as an electromagnetic wave and was therefore treated similar to sound waves. Since sound waves require a medium of propagation, therefore, light was also thought to require a medium which was called the ether. Numerous experiments, however, failed to detect the presence of the ether. Einstein then said that the ether doesn't exist and without a medium, light should propagate with equal speed in all directions. This came to be known as the constant speed of light. The story of the special theory of relativity begins with James Clerk Maxwell when he collected and consolidated many laws of electricity and magnetism into a single set of laws. When four such laws were put together, Maxwell showed the possibility of electromagnetic waves, which could be self-propagating because there were two orthogonal components, each of which created the other. An electromagnetic wave thus became a self-propagating system, like one hand drawing the other, while the second hand is drawn by the hand that draws it. At this juncture, Maxwell computed the speed of this electromagnetic wave, and it turned out to be about 186,000 miles per hour. Meanwhile, experiments were measuring the speed of light also to be around 186,000 miles per hour. This would have been too much of a coincidence that the measured speed of light turns out to be equal to the computed speed of electromagnetic waves. 
To avoid the conclusion that this was just a coincidence, light was deemed to be an electromagnetic wave. The question was that if light is a wave just like sound waves, then there must be a medium through which it propagates. For example, water waves propagate through solids, liquids and gases, which are called the mediums of propagation for the sound wave. Similarly, light waves must also travel through some medium which is static, similar to the solids, liquids or gases through which sound waves travel. This medium was postulated to be an all-pervasive static ether. Bodies like the earth were supposed to be traveling through the ether and the ether was supposed to generate a drag on the moving bodies just like solids, liquids and gases cause a drag on the sound waves. By the effect of the medium's drag on the sound wave, the speed of the wave is changed. Similarly, it was supposed that the ether must generate a drag on the light waves. Therefore, if we measured the speed of light in two directions, one that was along the direction of Earth's movement and the other that was along the direction perpendicular to the Earth's movement, then we should notice a difference between the speeds in the two directions. And so experiments were supposed to detect the ether's drag on the electromagnetic waves moving in different directions. One such experiment was the Michelson-Morley experiment. It used a half silvered mirror and shone light on it. Half of that light would go in the direction of Earth's movement and the other half will go in the direction perpendicular to that of the Earth's movement. Ultimately, both lights will come back to a detector where they will interfere with each other to produce an interference pattern. If the light speed varied in two directions, then the phase of the light wave would vary in the two directions and, they will, and that will change the interference patterns. The Michelson-Morley experiment showed that the interference patterns were consistent with the absence of ether drag. Rather, they implied that light was moving at a constant speed in two directions, one along the direction of the Earth's movement and the other perpendicular to that direction. This came to be known as the constant speed of light. It meant that there was no ether, hence no drag, and hence the speed of light was constant in all directions, even when this measurement was being done on a moving object such as the Earth. Einstein then used the results of the Michelson-Morley experiment and talked about the effects of constant speed of light on observations made using light. The Earth could be treated as one reference frame and a train moving on the Earth could be treated as another reference frame. If the speed of light is constant, then we can use that constant value to measure distance and durations. For example, we can emit a beam of light toward a mirror let it hit a remote mirror and be reflected back from the mirror. The round trip time it takes to send and receive the light beam can be multiplied by the constant speed of light to know the distance between the sender and the mirror because distance equals speed multiplied by time. Now under the ether drag hypothesis, if an observer moved toward the mirror with a constant speed, then he would receive the reflected light earlier. If he was moving away from the mirror with constant speed, then he would receive the reflected light later. The same measurement of distance using a reflected beam of light could be done by a stationary observer too. However, the stationary observer and the moving observer would observe different distances to the mirror. If the ether drag hypothesis was true, then the moving and the stationary observers could use the discrepancy between their measurement to say that at least one of the two observers is wrong about the distance. But the Michelson-Morley experiment disproved the ether drag hypothesis. Therefore, Einstein said, whether the observers are moving or stationary, 
they could not know if their measurements were right or wrong. They were simply empirical results that had to be taken on face value rather than interpreted in terms of the state of the observer. There was only one constant for all observers, namely the speed of light. Distance and time were adjustable parameters. Einstein now suggested that these adjustable parameters of distance and duration implied that the instruments being used in measurement were being modified by the movement. These changing instruments are called contracted length and dilated time. We will later discuss that time means a clock and distance means a meter. Therefore, length contraction means that a meter is shrinking and time dilation means that a clock is running slower. The observer using this clock and meter, however, doesn't know that the meter has contracted or the clock is running slower. He trusts his meter and clock as giving him true information about the state of reality. Therefore, even as the instrument adjusts, the observer, observer knows nothing about it. He accepts the value as if nothing has changed. If you haven't fully understood the concepts of time dilation and length contraction, don't worry. I will explain these concepts using intuitive everyday ideas. Length contraction and time dilation are some of the hardest things to understand for newcomers. This is because we look at instruments from a third person perspective. Therefore, in the following intuitive examples, I will illustrate the problem of length contraction and time dilation using human observers. We will then see that the problem is the same even in the case of human observers. And then we can drop the third person perspective used in science and see the same situation from a first person perspective. Einstein was very good at thought experiments. He could put himself into the shoes of others to create these thought experiments. But it is not always easy for everyone to do that. Hence, the ordinary human examples are very helpful. Let's talk about the first example. Suppose there is a boss with a secretary. The boss has many meetings and the secretary arranges these meetings. If the boss is short on time, then the secretary makes the meetings shorter. If the boss has ample time, then the secretary makes the meetings longer. When the meeting length is reduced, then the people in the meeting do their business quicker. For example, talking faster than usual. When the meeting length is long, then people in the meeting do their business slower, such as talking slower than usual. Overall, the boss gets the same amount of work done in a shorter or longer time. However, when the work is done in a short time, time appears to pass slowly. It is as if each person's clock has slowed down and they are doing much more in a short time because time is passing slowly. So even if the clock on the wall says 10 minutes have passed, it seems like 30 minutes to each person. The clock time is 10 minutes and the conscious time is 30 minutes. To reconcile this discrepancy, we can say that 10 minutes has become 30 minutes. So the clock has effectively slowed down and the time has dilated. Meanwhile, the work must have shrunk since so much work is done in 10 minutes. We can illustrate the same issue with yet another example. Suppose there are two people, one anxious and the other relaxed. The anxious person does more work in a short time, but that short time looks long to him. The anxious person also dies sooner. The relaxed person does less work in a long time, but that long time looks the same to him as the time of an anxious person. The relaxed person also lives longer. Thus, conscious time decides a person's lifetime or how long it felt to him while clock time decides the objective time how it or how it felt to other people. 
This idea is presented in Vedic texts by saying that everyone lives for 100 years from their perspective, even though they may be living shorter or longer lives from the perspective of others. We can compare a human with a fly for an illustration. The human lives for 100 years by his estimation and the fly just lives for a few days by the human's estimation. But in the estimation of the fly, it has lived for 100 years, although it seems much shorter to the human. The difference between the fly and the human arises because the fly flaps the wings much faster than a human moves his hands. Each flap of the fly's wings is one unit of work for the fly. Similarly, each movement of a human's hand is one unit of work for the human. The fly thinks that she did as much work in her life as a man does in a long life because both have moved their wings and hands an equal number of times. If we restrict ourselves to this thinking, then both have done the same amount of work. From a personal perspective, the hundred year life of a fly is as much work as the hundred year life of a human. That feeling is relative to each observer but it is not the whole truth. It is just a personal truth. The same problem arises for distances when we look through a microscope and a telescope. We cannot see the ultra small or the ultra large by the naked eye. The telescope makes the ultra large comparable to the human size and the microscope makes the super small comparable to the human size. By such contraction and, and expansion, we get to see something that might look like one inch long, although it may be a few micrometers or several million meters. Einstein describes everything from a third person perspective. This makes things very confusing. There is a better way to understand the same thing if you look at the same situation from the first person perspective. Just think of a difficult time in your life. When the difficult time arrives, it seems that time is passing very slowly. And yet lots of things can be accomplished in that time precisely because the time seems very long and to pass it we have to keep doing more and more. Therefore, during the difficult time in life, we can accomplish a lot because every hour seems much longer than an hour seems to a happy person. Conversely, the happy time passes easily and little is achieved in that time. Of course, when a bad time arrives, most people pass it either by making it happier through entertainment or by doing a lot of useless and wasteful activities. If we can avoid that tendency, then we can accomplish a lot during a bad time. For a person, time passing slowly is time dilation. A lot being achieved during that time is length contraction. A contracted length is the work getting smaller. A dilated clock is time getting longer. A moving observer is simply a person going through a difficult time. A static observer is simply a person going through an easy time. Difficulty makes us active and accomplished. Comfort makes us inactive and unaccomplished. Even as relativity talks about the equivalence of stationary and moving observers, everyone knows that travel, traveling tires us, while a stationary life feels rested and relaxed. When we travel, we always think about when the travel is going to end. When we are stationary, we don't think about when the travel is going to begin. Thus, everyone can know whether they are moving or stationary because the time passes with difficulty during motion and makes a person tired. The equivalence of all observers can be easily refuted because we get tired during traveling and we are not tired if we are stationary. Of course, we don't talk about this tiring and relaxed experience in science. We just talk about a dilated and contracted clock. Thereby, the method of detecting who is moving and who is stationary is disregarded by science. But if we apply this principle of difficult and easy times to our lives, 
then we can say that the difficult time is welcome because it helps us achieve a lot. Then the relaxing time is welcome because it helps us enjoy that achievement. If there was no achievement, then relaxing time would be very boring. If there was no relaxation, then a difficult life would be very tough. Therefore, both relaxing and difficult times are good for different reasons. These principles are not intuitive at the third person level, but they become intuitive at the first person level. Once we see the equivalence between how time in our life seems longer and shorter, and how more is achieved during difficult time and less is achieved during an easy time, then we can understand that instruments are also conscious observers because they are exhibiting the properties of conscious observers with regard to easier and harder times. All the weirdness we feel about relativity is because we think that instruments are unconscious things. Therefore, we have to stop thinking about instruments and think about ourselves. When we understand how we feel about dilating and contracting times, then we can say that instruments are behaving just like us. After the special theory of relativity, Einstein set about trying to develop a more general theory of relativity that included gravitation. The difference between the special and general relativity is that special relativity only talks about observers moving at constant speeds, but general relativity also talks about accelerating observers. All accelerations in Newton's physics require some force. Of course, the acceleration may not be caused only by gravitational force. But if gravitational force is the only type of force as in Newton's mechanics, then acceleration must be attributed only to the gravitational force. When we try to formulate Newton's laws, we get a circularity in the definition of mass. For instance, mass is detected only when gravitational force is present, and gravitational force is detected only when mass is present. Therefore, we define gravity in terms of mass and mass in terms of gravity. To escape this circular definition, Newton talked about another way of measuring mass through the backward force we experience while accelerating forward. The question, of course, is how are we accelerating? The cause could be a petrol engine or a steam engine. Neither of these two are based on gravitational force. So Newton hoped to define mass through this backward force and then talk about gravitational force based on this mass. The question was also why we feel the backward force during a forward acceleration. The Newtonian answer was that there is an ether which drags the body backwards. Now, having removed the need for an ether in case of electromagnetic waves, Einstein sought to remove the ether in Newton's mechanics too. His conclusion was that since there is no ether, and there is no steam engine or petrol engine within Newton's gravitational theory. Therefore, the acceleration must happen due to gravity. Within the confines of gravitational theory, we can equate the inertial mass that causes the backward push on acceleration to the gravitational mass that causes the forward push for acceleration. We can understand these ideas through the example of riding a roller coaster. When we go upwards on a roller coaster, we feel a backward push due to gravity. When we go downwards on a roller coaster, we again feel a forward push due to gravity. Therefore, if the roller coaster was not moving due to an engine, we could talk about the effect of gravity causing the movement. This type of scenario is useful in talking about the cosmos which is not moving due to an engine. Hence, Einstein simply equated acceleration to gravitational force. When we equate the gravitational and inertial masses, then the drag of the ether is replaced by gravity. Conversely, since objects bend in space due to the gravitational force, 
We can also say that this bending is simply the result of a curved ether. Einstein therefore did three things. First, he equated inertial and gravitational masses. Second, he got rid of the ether. And third, he attributed all the curving and bending processes of gravity to the curvature of space itself. Since observers are still in space and they are affected by gravity, therefore the time dilation and length contraction effects would continue as before. If space is now curved and hence space becomes elongated, the accelerating observer will cover it much faster than a stationary observer. Hence for him, the distance will seem even more compressed and the time will appear to pass even slower. Thus, all principles of special relativity were generalized for the accelerating observers. Space and time were already interlinked due to special relativity. They just got interlinked again due to gravity. The result was a space-time that could be stretched, compressed, curved, or straightened. The properties of space-time uniformity upheld in Newtonian mechanics were dropped. The total mass and energy were still conserved. Einstein's theory received numerous confirmations, but the best one was during a solar eclipse when light reaching the Earth from a distant star would pass very close to the sun and the sun's gravitational force would bend that light since space was itself curved now. The result of that light bending was that the observed star position during the eclipse will be different than after the eclipse. This was indeed confirmed by observation and it established the idea that light bends in space because gravity curves the space. There were several adverse effects of Einstein's theory too, namely that the idea that observation gives us the pristine truth of reality was destroyed. In classical empirical thinking, we can measure each object state in isolation as if the observer of the world is outside the world and looks at the world without being affected by the world. This allowed meters and clocks to be treated as observers outside the universe which were not affected by the matter in the universe. But Einstein ruined that idea by saying that observers were within the universe and hence matter affected the process of observation. We could no longer know each thing in isolation. We had to rather know everything at once in order to know anything at all. Since that was impossible, therefore, we could never know the pristine truth. All we could say was that we will observe and no observer could be called better than the other observers. Classical empirical thinking was created after assuming that human observers produce subjective knowledge that was unreliable. Instruments were trusted because they were giving us reliable information. But relativity showed that even instruments were affected by matter. For example, our instruments could themselves be elongated, shortened, curved, or straightened. When the instruments are themselves being modified by matter, then the results are also not giving us the objective pristine truth. Very specifically, the truth we get from an instrument is the collective product of everything in the universe, not the truth of one specific thing in the universe. Thus, knowledge gained by the instrument is also relative to that instrument as other instruments show other results. The net result of relativity was the replacement of the word subjectivity with the word relativity. The two words mean the same thing because a meter and clock are just observers. If human observation was relative to the human observer, then instrument measurement is relative to the instrument. A modified instrument would always give a modified result. Einstein's theory did not appear in a vacuum. There was considerable philosophical undercurrent from a school of philosophy called logical positivism, which was trying to convert all troublesome words into empirically verifiable words. Logical positivists hope 
that if they could convert all words into empirical measurements, then all problems of philosophy would be solved. For example, if someone uses the word coolness, then the word would not be admitted into a discussion unless there was an objective measurement of coolness. By such objectification, either words like beauty, justice, and truth would be given empirically verifiable procedures or they will be eliminated from the language altogether. Einstein took a leaf out of logical positivism and started applying it to physics. Words like space and time are actually metaphysical words in physics because nobody can measure space and time. Einstein then tried to convert metaphysics into physics. His solution was that if the word space was replaced by the word meter, then metaphysical space would become a physical space. Similarly, if the word time was replaced by the word clock, then the metaphysical time would become physical time. Thus, by replacing space with meter and time with clock, metaphysics will be replaced by physics, quite in line with logical positivism trying to convert metaphysical words like truth, beauty, and justice into physical measurements. Now when Einstein redefined space as meter and time as clock, then the words lost all objective meaning because the length of the meter and the periodicity of the clock are not universal objective facts. The length and curvature of a meter changes in a gravitational field. The periodicity of a clock changes in a gravitational field. Therefore, instead of getting objectivity from logical positivism, Einstein again got subjectivity. Of course, this subjectivity was called relativity instead of subjectivity. These results are not at all surprising because the sizes of planetary orbits depend on the masses of the planets. Similarly, the periodicity of the planet going around the sun depends on the mass of the planet. Therefore, both length and time are determined by mass. If we take an object with mass such as a meter and a clock, then gravitational force should affect the meter and the clock in exactly the same way that it affects the planet. If planets are as much material objects as the clocks and meters, then the gravitational force has to have the same effect on them too. Similarly, when a planet rotates, it is deformed by the rotation. Not just its length, but also its periodicity changes. If meter and clock are just like a planet, then they too will be deformed by the gravitational force, and then their lengths and periodicities will also change. Logical positivism had not thought through its claims. It had simply assumed the classical empirical thinking to be true when it is not true. Meters and clocks are as much subject to the problems of subjectivity as the human observers. There is no fundamental difference between a human observer and the instrument as far as the measurement procedure goes. Thus, when the claims of logical positivism were applied to science, the results are totally opposite to what logical positivism had expected. Instead of destroying metaphysical words where the objective meaning was unknown, now the metaphysical words were physical and still the objective meaning was unknown. All instruments were now material and each material instrument was deformed by other matter in the universe and its results were not the objective definition of anything. It was as subjective as the observers conditioned by their past history. In complete contrast to logical positivism, which was trying to establish objective truth, there was a parallel attempt at relativization of all objectivity to human observers. This relativization appeared as the result of the destruction of the authority of the church and the demise of the rule of kings 
who until then decided what the truth was. As the imperial system and the ecclesiastical system was collapsing, the nature of religious truth and the nature of what laws govern society were left to the people rather than central authorities. The first such major transformation occurred with the end of the divine rights of kings, queens, priests, and nuns. The imperial system was replaced by a democratic system, and political power went from kings and queens into the hands of common people. Similarly, during the Protestant Reformation, the power in the hand of priests and nuns to interpret and explain scripture was passed to the common people who were all considered equally good priests and nuns who had the right to interpret and explain scripture in their own way. In the arena of the government, the imperial system was replaced by the election of common people to the roles of presidents, prime ministers, ministers, elected representatives of a parliament and a professional jury. The work done by the imperial system was similarly replaced by a professional departments that could frame their own rules and regulations and formulate their system of self-governance. By the removal of a central power authority in the form of a king or a queen, the power was democratized into hundreds of power centers. In this democratizing process, what emerged was a system of contracts in which people could choose to frame their personal contracts and sign those contracts with other parties that agreed to their terms. Marriage was no longer a holy joining of a couple. It was a contract. The government was not God's representative on earth. It was just a contract between the rulers and the ruled. A business was not obligated to do the moral duty. It was bound only by the laws and terms that it had agreed to abide by. People were not lifelong bound to a landowner. They could freely move from one profession or employer to another, renegotiating their employer-employee contracts. Again, the central power vested in the elitist institutions was replaced by democratic power distributed across millions of individuals. The net result of all this democratization was that all traditional institutions such as marriage, family, and community began to weaken or break down, while the new institutions based on contracts became entrenched. With the breakdown of marriage, family, and community, society got nuclear families, divorced couples, single parents, and fluid organizations. Things were no longer stable. There was no sacred morals, values, or laws to be upheld for all time to come or even for a long time. All laws, systems, and institutions were up for reformation or they would be abandoned by people. The result was a dramatic increase in individualism. Each individual thinking that they have the right to decide what truth, beauty, and justice means and go about implementing their ideas or abandoning the system that they did not agree with. When individualism rises in a society, then no two people can agree with each other. There is no objective truth anymore because everyone is free to choose the truth, right, and good they want. Modern society is predicated on the assumption that there is no universality of truth, right, and good. It is up to the people to decide what kind of truth, right, and good they want. Scientists may insist on some laws, but that is also an institutional agreement. Those who disagree can leave the institution. If the majority of the institution decides to reform science, then it can. The individuals who don't agree with the institutions can work outside the limits and bounds set by the institutions. All institutions bring some benefits and some problems. The benefit is that you get some consensus. The problem is that the consensus may be false and there is no way to change the institution unless majority of the people in it agree to such a change. 
Thus, relativism goes very well with modern cultural, democratic, and individualistic thinking. It is completely contrary to the classical objective truth thinking. This is why when relativism was introduced in science, it did not find serious opposition because the rest of the society had already embraced this ideology. If the rest of the society had not embraced it, then there would be attempts to explain the Michelson Morley experiment in other ways and reject the relativism. But when society at large agrees with the relativism, then its introduction into the bastion of objectivity called science also faces no objections. We will now turn toward the problems of relativity theory. There are two major classes of problems. First, there is growing experimental evidence that gravitational theory and Einstein's modification of it are inadequate to explain the observations. Second, relativity theory is incompatible with quantum mechanics and over a century of effort to bring them together has failed. We will discuss both these issues one after another. Let's begin with the mystery of dark energy. The Big Bang model of the cosmos postulates that energy and matter were initially concentrated into a singularity. After the Big Bang, this concentrated energy and matter started expanding and the universe appeared in its present form. The initial confirmation of the Big Bang came from the observation of red shifted light, which indicates that the universe is expanding. What was expected at that time is that this expansion would continue for a very long time, although the rate of expansion would decrease. The observations, however, showed that not only is the expansion continuing, but it is also accelerating. This is not at all expected because an accelerating expansion means that new energy is being created in the universe. Instead of being billions of years further from the Big Bang, we are rather living through a new Big Bang where increasing amounts of energy is being released from its formerly concentrated state. Why would some energy be released at Big Bang and some other energy be released much after the Big Bang? Nobody seems to know the answer. The second big problem is that of the rotation of the outer regions of a galaxy. As we know from the solar system, the outermost planets such as Saturn, Neptune, and Pluto go around the sun much slower compared to the innermost planets such as Mercury, Mars, and Venus. This is because the gravitational force decreases with distance and pulls the planets weakly towards the center. With weakening centrifugal force, the rate of rotation of the planets also decreases. If this principle is applied to a galaxy as a whole, then the outer regions of the galaxy must rotate slower than the inner regions. Again, this is contrary to observation. Observations show that outer regions of the galaxy have faster speeds than the inner regions. To explain this faster rotation, we have to suppose that there is a massive amount of hidden matter in the center of the galaxy that is causing the outer regions of the galaxy to rotate faster and faster. But if such matter was present, then the inner regions of the galaxy would go even faster and the current observable speeds would be falsified. Thus, there is no situation in which the problem is easily solvable. To worsen the problem, the total amount of missing matter and energy, sometimes called dark matter and dark energy, is estimated to be 96% of the total matter in the universe. While enormous diversity is seen within the remaining 4%, the 96% is just bundled together because nobody knows how to study it, there are no good theoretical explanations about this type of matter, and certainly no good experiments have been conducted thus far to either confirm or deny its existence. How the understanding of the 
will change our understanding of the 4% is anybody's guess right now. The further problem is that within that 4% of the supposedly known matter, there are serious problems of unifying quantum theory and general relativity, which is sometimes called the problem of quantum gravity. Therefore, it is not as if the remaining 4% is known very well. Even that 4% of matter doesn't have a single unified theory at present. To compound this problem, as we have discussed earlier, there is no known way of reconciling general relativity and quantum mechanics because they invoke different kinds of parthood. In general relativity, the concept of parthood is just like in classical mechanics, namely that we try to cut a big apple to get smaller pieces of apple. In quantum mechanics, the concept of parthood is that just like ordinary observations, namely that we cannot separate taste and smell from the apple pieces and any attempt to separate taste and smell will change both. These two ideas of parthood cannot be reconciled in any known theory because we cannot understand the second type of parthood within current science. As we have discussed in the previous video on quantum collapse and entanglement, Quantum mechanics requires us to think of the same thing in three ways, which is possible only if we conceive reality as word meaning rather than as objects and properties. Since that is not expected to happen anytime soon, therefore the quantum mechanics problem will not be resolved and the unity with relativity will not be achieved. The final nail in the coffin is that quantum mechanics itself involves a role of consciousness in three ways. As we have discussed, quantum phenomena must explain three classes of behaviors, namely deterministic, occasional or seemingly random, and volitional. If the deterministic behavior doesn't exist, the normal body operations such as digestion, immunity, circulation, and breathing would stop. If the behavior was always deterministic, then we will never observe occasional exceptions to these deterministic behaviors, such as disease and death. Finally, if the behaviors were only deterministic and occasional, then we couldn't do nothing about those behaviors based on our choice and will. Therefore, anything less than an explanation of these three classes of behaviors is inadequate for science. The science that will explain deterministic behavior, seeming randomness, and volitional control is far from the reach of any present scientific conception. The problems in front of science are very serious, but the attention given to a problem is inversely proportional to its importance because the less important problems are easy to solve and the more important problems are harder. Working on hard problems is career limiting. Working on easy problems is career rewarding. Therefore, everyone works on the easy problems and not on the hard problems. Since attention to a problem is inversely proportional to its importance, therefore, the most important problems are never discussed. This is why people like us make videos about the most important problems to bring attention to them. In this video, we have talked about the origins and problems of relativity. We will use the next video to discuss their solutions.